Hello, my name is Dr. Bob Aksarani. I am the chief of the Center for Trauma and Critical Care at the George Washington University Hospital. The Society of Critical Care Medicine would like to put out some just-in-time training videos for our non-intensivist colleagues should we experience a sudden surge in respiratory failure <clears throat> related to the, uh, to the COVID virus. So the purpose of this video is to discuss the very basics of mechanical ventilation. Uh, up front, I'll tell you that we are not going to talk about advanced modes of me mechanical ventilation specifically. We are not going to talk about APRV, bi-level, uh, also called airway pressure release ventilation. We're not going to talk about SIMV, pressure support ventilation or pressure control ventilation. We are solely going to talk about volume control, assist control modes of ventilation. So with that in mind, when you talk about a volume control mode of ventilation, there are several variables that you have to program within that mode, that you have to prescribe within that mode. I will also say it is imperative that you partner with your respiratory therapist because some of the modes are named differently based on the manufacturer of the ventilator. And I'll give you some examples. But you need to partner up with your respiratory therapist so that if I use a particular term that your manufacturer uses a different term, the respiratory therapist can help translate what it is you're trying to do. So within volume control mode, one of the first variables that you need to prescribe is the specific mode of ventilation. For our purposes, we're gonna talk about assist control. Now some ventilators may call that PRVC, some ventilators may call that VC plus, other ventilators may call it something entirely different. But at the end of the day, what this means is you and I control the tidal volume being administered. The amount of air going in and out of the patient is controlled by us. The next variable that needs to be programmed is the respiratory rate, followed by the tidal volume, followed by the FiO2, or the amount of oxygen, and lastly, the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure, the pressure at the end of exhalation. Let's talk about each of these things in turn. When we talk about assist control mode, if we graph out what this looks like, here's time, here's the tidal volume. We have decided to prescribe, let's just say, 500 milliliters of air. So the patient will get 500 milliliters of air with each breath because the volume is controlled. And let's say that we've decided to put in a respiratory rate of 10. That's one breath every six seconds. Six times 10 is 60. So here's your patient and he or she is breathing one breath every six seconds. The question is, <clears throat> at each breath is 500 milliliters because we said so. The question is what's gonna happen when the patient decides to take a breath right there? And the answer is because this is a fully assisted breath, assist control, the person will get 500 milliliters of air with very little effort. So you programmed in a respiratory rate of 10, but guess what? The patient wants to breathe 14 times per minute. Those additional four breaths will each receive 500 milliliters of air. When the patient begins the process of inhaling, drops their diaphragm, the circuit senses a negative change in pressure and the machine kicks in and gives the patient 500 milliliters of air with very little effort. So the benefit of this mode is you're guaranteed to give the prescribed tidal volume, the prescribed minute ventilation. If you go into PRVC, VC plus or something else, all that means is you've taken assist control and made the gas flow, the speed with which the gas flows into the patient variable. You, that, that creates better patient comfort, but otherwise it really has no bearing on outcome. If you take somebody who's on PRVC, for example, with variable gas flow, the guy sometimes likes to breathe hard, sometimes likes to breathe easy, adjusts to him or her. What that, and, and you give that person rocuronium, let's say, you paralyze them, you've converted that person to an assist control mode because then they, don't, they no longer matter. They're no longer having any inspiratory effort. All right, next knob that you need to program. The respiratory rate and the tidal volume. This is a very, very important point. Respiratory rate times tidal volume is equal to the minute ventilation. How often you move air, respiratory rate, how much air you move per breath equals the total amount of air moved on a per minute basis, minute ventilation. 
Miniventilation is inversely proportional to the CO2, to the PCO2. As the guy breathes faster and harder, the PCO2 goes down. He or she will breathe off their carbon dioxide. And you'll recall that as carbon dioxide goes down, pH comes up because carbon dioxide is a acid. So miniventilation is directly proportional to the pH. In other words, an increase in the minute ventilation equals a decrease in the PCO2, which results in an increase in the pH. This is extremely important. So that at the end of the day, when it comes to the mechanical ventilator, really the number you care about is the minute ventilation, not so much the tidal volume or the respiratory rate per se. Okay? What minute ventilation do you need? Where should you start? We'll talk about that in a second. And then last, and certainly not least, are these two variables, the FiO2 and the PEEP. These are the two variables that mainly affect oxygen exchange on the ventilator. If respiratory rate and tidal volume, and thus minute ventilation, impact the CO2 exchange, these two impact O2 exchange. All right, so let's talk about where do you begin. You've just intubated a patient, you prescribe the assist control motor ventilation or the PRVC or the VC plus, it's all the same thing. You tell the respiratory therapist, put them on volume control. That would be the magic words. How much respiratory rate and tidal volume? Well, what's normal minute ventilation? In you and me, when we sit around the house bored, generally speaking, our respiratory rate is about 10 breaths per minute. And all comers, all sizes, generally speaking, the average tidal volume in an adult is 500 milliliters, roughly. That means that normal minute ventilation is 5,000 milliliters per minute, or if you will, five liters per minute. This is normal. Okay, understand that you just intubated this patient for a reason, whatever this person is, he or she is not normal. They're probably building acid from their underlying critical illness. So whatever minute ventilation they need, it'll be more than five liters per minute. Pick a number, eight liters a minute, 10 liters a minute. Really depends on how acidotic they are and how much you need to blow off their CO2 to begin with. So knowing that, you can start kind of figure out what these actual numbers should be. The, the tidal volume in somebody who does not have ARDS, does not have ARDS, should be roughly eight to 10 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, ideal body weight. So if you come up to somebody, and I kind of, I just eyeball them. If I come up to somebody, and I kind of figure, nah, their ideal body weight is about 800, uh, is about 80 kilograms. Eight times 10 is 800. 800 cc tidal volume is a bit high. I would go ahead and dial that guy down a little bit to maybe 650 milliliters. So you can kind of eyeball it a little bit, get in that neighborhood of eight to 10 cc's per kilo. If they do have ARDS, you need to dial down the tidal volume. For that individual, you really want to aim for a tidal volume somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six cc's per kilo ideal body weight. Now remember, as you drop the tidal volume from eight cc's per kilo to five cc's per kilo, as you drop that tidal volume, you are dropping minute ventilation. And as you drop minute ventilation, PCO2 starts to rise and pH goes down. So you may need to defend that respiratory acidosis by going up on the respiratory rate to offset the decrease in the tidal volume. How much do you go up on the respiratory rate? Again, depends. So stepping back for a second, I knew that I wanted to give my friend a, um, a minute ventilation of 10 liters per minute. It's a number I just picked out of thin air because the guy's acidotic. I wanna give him double the minute ventilation a normal person gets. Well, if he or she is getting 500 milliliter breaths, that's the total volume I've, I've put in, to make it 10 liters per minute, the respiratory rate must be 20 breaths per minute, right? 20 times 10, 20 times 500 is 10,000 or 10 liters. That's how you come up with the respiratory rate and the tidal volume. But there are pipers to pay for every decision you make. So as you start to go up on that respiratory rate to try to offset the decrease in the tidal volume, you have to look at this curve and it looks like this, it'll be on the ventilator. This is the flow curve. It measures gas flow in milliliters per minute. Okay? And this is kind of what it looks like. Okay? 
By convention, any time the line is above the x-axis, the patient is inhaling, inspiration. Any time the line is below the x-axis, the patient is exhaling. The slope is simply the rate at which he or she is exhaling and inhaling. Now let's breathe for a second and see how this works. You go, <gasps> respiratory pause, <sighs> apneic pause, <gasps> apneic pause, <sighs> apneic pause. So between each cycle of our breathing, we actually take a break. As you start to increase that respiratory rate, this is what may happen. Okay? Because you took that respiratory rate, let's say, to 30 breaths per minute, some big number, that's one breath every two seconds, there's not enough time for the patient to exhale because exhalation is a passive process and takes time. So in this instance, when we dialed in a respiratory rate that high, here's how it goes. <gasps> apneic pause. <gasps> apneic pause. <gasps> You'll notice that the patient never stopped exhaling before he or she started to inhale again, right there. Because there was not enough time to exhale. The line does not come to the x-axis and stay on the x-axis. Rather, it shoots straight across the x-axis. This is referred to as auto-peeping. Some people would call it breath stacking. Now, does it matter? Maybe, maybe not. Kind of depends. If you have a little bit of auto peep, like for example, if it looks like that, it probably doesn't matter. That degree of auto peep down here really doesn't matter. But if you have a big degree of auto peep such as that, that may matter. And we're going to talk about peep in a second as to why that may be. But you can only go so high on the respiratory rate. Once you start seeing auto-peeping, that's about the limit. It needs to start backing down a little bit. And that might cost you some acidosis, but it is what it is. Okay? So we talked about how to prescribe the minute ventilation in terms of cc's per kilo of tidal volume that should be dialed in. 8 to 10 cc's per kilo for the normal patient. 5 to 6 cc's per kilo for the ARDS patient. And we talked about how to figure out the respiratory rate based on the target minute ventilation we want. Let's talk about FiO2 and PEEP. Obviously, we're gonna start with an FiO2 of 100% because oxygen is cheap, might as well just give it. And then we'll back down. Let's talk about the PEEP. There are three factors, there are three factors that impact oxygen exchange at the level of the alveoli. The three factors are FiO2, the amount of oxygen you give. The second one is time, which we're not going to talk about. That's how advanced mechanical ventilation works. And the last one is surface area. And that's where PEEP comes in. So here I've got an alveolus. And let's say it's full of stuff. It could be full of pulmonary edema fluid. It could be full of blood, alveolar hemorrhage. It could be full of pus, pneumonia. It could be full of hyalinaceous debris, ARDS. Doesn't really matter. It's full of stuff. And that means that when the air goes in, it has very little surface area across which to diffuse. But if I take that same patient and I put a lot of PEEP in, let's say this is 5 of PEEP, and I put a lot of PEEP in, here's 15 of PEEP, now all of a sudden that same water column has dropped down because at the end of exhalation, the alveolus is more distended, positive end expiratory pressure. More pressure, more gas left in the patient, more surface area. Now, all of a sudden, I have all this surface area I can use to exchange gas. That's how PEEP works. The problem is, when you have a series of alveoli, it takes a long time for the PEEP to kick in. <clears throat> so here is one area of the lung, let's just say. And here's an alveolus, here's an alveolus, here's an alveolus, and here comes some PEEP. And that air, that, that pressure that's coming in has to then be dissipated across all these alveoli, and that's gonna take time. So think of FiO2 as a very rapid maneuver. Think of PEEP as more of a slow and sustained maneuver, okay? We've all given oxygen to patients via nasal cannula or via face mask. If it's gonna work, it's gonna work. The O2 set will come up very quickly. The PEEP will take time to distend these alveoli out ever so slowly. 
most people will start with a PEEP level of five, just for showing up. You intubate someone, you put them on a PEEP of five. We will increase PEEP in aliquots of around 2.5 to five centimeters of water. So maybe we'll go from a PEEP of five to a PEEP of eight, to a PEEP of 10, to a PEEP of 12. A very high PEEP would be a PEEP greater than 15. Let's just say something like 15 to 20 would be considered very high PEEP. Normal PEEP, if you will, if there's any such thing as normal PEEP, is a PEEP of five. Now, what are some things to worry about as you start getting to very high PEEPs? That lung is so distended now, and there's so much positive pressure, one of a couple of things could happen. First of all, you could easily incur a pneumothorax if one of those alveoli bursts. Secondly, you can have a drop in the blood pressure. And the reason is, as the chest becomes more and more positively charged, blood has a harder and harder time returning back up to the heart passively in the venous system. So you get less venous return, less cardiac output, less cardiac output, less blood pressure. So beware of hypotension once you get to high peeps. And the third one, which is a bit rare, but it can certainly happen, is a paradoxical decrease in the O2 saturation, in the O2 sat. And the reason is the alveolus is so distended, it actually compresses or swishes the capillary next to it. And you actually create a shunt by increasing the peep too high. In which case, if you see a paradoxical desaturation back down on the peep a little bit, you might find the sats come up kind of paradoxically. So we've talked about the mode, we've talked about respiratory rate and tidal volume, minute ventilation, how minute ventilation is inversely proportional to the PCO2. As minute vent goes up, PCO2 goes down. Minute ventilation is directly proportional to the pH. As minute vent goes up, pH goes up because you're blowing off the acid. We talked about how to figure out these two numbers, eight to 10 cc's per kilo for tidal volume in the normal patient, five to six in the ARDS patient, and the respiratory rate is meant to just simply target where you'll want your metaventilation to be. And we talked about FiO2, we're gonna start at 100% and peep. Now, a couple of last minute points to kind of bear in mind. You never ever want to see a respiratory, a, a ventilator setting that is this. This would be a real mistake. An FiO2 of 100% with a PEEP of five. Why? Because you've used up all of your rapid deployment forces, if you will, and if this person desaturates, you have no more room to go. By the time you increase the PEEP and the PEEP kicks in, it'll be potentially hours while the patient's desaturating. So pick a number of FiO2 that makes you feel uncomfortable. For me, the number is 60%. As I exceed 60% FiO2, I start to raise the PEEP up concomitant to my FiO2, so I'm kind of walking with both legs, trying to bring that, that FiO2 back down, utilizing the PEEP, okay? You always wanna have some buffer on the FiO2. And then lastly, I'll give you a couple of little pearls about what to do if the patient suddenly desaturates on you. Obviously, rule out mechanical issues. Make sure that the endotracheal tube is not dislodged, the circuit is not broken, the person does not have a pneumothorax. Once you've kind of figured out the person is desaturating solely because their lungs are getting worse, then there are some pharmacologic adjuncts you can give to buy yourself some time. So for bad desaturation, one maneuver, obviously the person's already intubated on the ventilator, is to paralyze them. If you give that patient something like 100 milligrams of rocuronium, you may increase the O2 saturation. And the reason is, the biggest utilizer of oxygen in the human body is the skeletal muscle, because there's so much of it. So by giving the person a paralytic, what you've done is remove that skeletal muscle, and then it becomes supply and demand economics. Then demand just dropped, so supply went up. And relatively speaking, you may find that O2 saturation comes up by about five percentage points or something in that neighborhood. The other option, if you happen to have it, is to give the person an inhaled arterial dilator. The two most commonly used ones are inhaled nitric oxide and inhaled prostacyclin. Goes by the trade name Flolan. Um, each of these goes in through the endotracheal tube and goes to the alveoli that are being aerated. Does not go to the alveoli that are full of hyalinaceous debris and unrecruitable. 
By going to the alveoli that are being aerated, they cross over and preferentially dilate the capillary beds and the arteries in the immediate area of the alveolus. So what you're basically doing is reestablishing VQ matching. That's what you're trying to do, okay? So two good pharmacologic adjuncts, if you, I'm sure you have um, rocuronium, you may or may not have nitric oxide or flolan, uh, but either of these usually helps at least buy you some time to improve oxygenation. And the last thing I would say is, as you start going down all the various adjuncts we've talked about, as the PEEP starts to come up, as the FiO2 starts to come up, as you're now hanging paralytics, starting to think about inhaled prostacyclins, that's the time when we probably should get the main intensivist back into the game. This is a patient that is deteriorating and may benefit from advanced modes of mechanical ventilation and or other therapies like proning them and perhaps even ECMO. So this is the overview on how mechanical ventilation 101 works. Um, happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm a pretty easy guy to find, again, at the George Washington University Hospital, working in conjunction with the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Thank you.